Hello and welcome to this second Jog Ramblings blog video and for February we're going to be looking at the geography of the coronavirus which is all over the news, you can't avoid it at all and as I make this recording on the 25th of February there's even been some, some news out this morning regarding whether they may have synthesised a vaccine or are they close to uh, human trials of a vaccine so it's, a, it's an ongoing situation. Obviously bearing that in mind that when, when we learn case studies they do quickly progress very very quickly but hopefully uh, this video will stand the test of time because we're going to look at the, the geographical kind of picture of the coronavirus. So I'm going to start with this map right here and this is something that's, that's been tweeted, shared, passed around especially by certain news outlets um, particularly the tabloid news uh, showing the spread, or they are claiming the spread, potential spread of the coronavirus. So we have these really, really kind of powerful um, headlines that they're using, and they're using very emotive words like horrifying new map is showing no country is safe for the coronavirus. Terrifying map shows thousands of Wuhan uh, travelers spreading across the globe, etc., and how the map should be spreading or could spread across the globally. But we as geographers, of course, want to be thinking really, really critically about this. And for those of us who, who study this quite a lot, or we, we teach about globalization, we'll notice that this is actually an airline network map. So this is not to do with the spread of the coronavirus at all. In fact, where the confusion for this has come has come from a University of Southampton um, study for their World Population Project. And I think this is a bit of a shame, really, because the, this map was taken out of context by a lot of media outlets, and they were using it to say this is how the virus is going to spread. But these guys were just basically demonstrating that how transport links are today, how the airline network is today, and how the avenues of which a virus could spread, particularly with the coronavirus, the way that it's spread. Um, and I think... The bad thing for this, I think they took that tweet and that thread of tweet down rather than using it to explain, no, this is the context of it. And of course, that means that people have been able to make their own stories up from it and, and kind of spread a little bit of panic uh, and a little bit of um, unsubstantiated facts about the coronavirus. So whenever you see a graphic, make sure you double check with the source it's come from and the context that it's used. So of course, when in this project, um, in, this, in this study, they're using statistics like this that an estimated nearly 60,000 people might have travelled to almost 400 cities worldwide before the Wuhan authorities have made a travelling ban. Yes, of course, that might be true, but to use every single airline network, every single plane that flies from A to B to demonstrate that is a little bit misleading. Now, what this video is not going to do is focus on the background information to the coronavirus, because again, there's so much things that, that, that you could find on there. One um, source I really strongly recommend you check out is the official um, World Health Organization information. They have a really good, fantastic video about, about the coronavirus, this iteration of the coronavirus. So we have some fantastic information and fantastic animations. So do check that out. Okay, so what we're going to do here is that we're gonna have a look at the geographical um, progression of the coronavirus. Of course, it started here in the province of, of Hubei, which is where the city of Wuhan is located. And this map here, as it says here, was for the uh, 22nd of January, and that's gonna be an important time step that I'll come back to in a second. But what, um, so I'll take you to some through some dates here. So the 31st of December, for instance, um, Wuhan was, this was the first instant where the Wuhan local government actually declared that there was some kind of, of, of local epidemic taking place. Now to define the term epidemic, it's an epidemiological term which, which is important to define, and that means um, a series of cases or disease cases which is spiking above the normal. So the opposite of an epidemic is an endemic. Now an endemic is your usual background kind of rates of disease in epidemiology. So your normal rates of, your background rates of measles and things like that, they are called endemics. They're in the population already, they spread quite regularly and there's usually low incidences and they take place as a, as a matter of course. Whereas an epidemic is when you get a sudden uh, spike of cases and a cluster of cases and then some measures need to be taken place because it's out of the ordinary. So now we have um, a potential epidemic taking place on the 31st December, but there's still no studies have been linking it 
with human-to-human -human um, transmission. So, so perhaps the epidemic hasn't been declared just yet on the 31st of December, but it, as we know, it does get declared very, very shortly. But especially now on the 11th of January, we start to have the first death. And this was a 60-year-old um, man who used to travel regularly to the market in Wuhan, um, where the virus is first to be, thought to be sourced. So we have this only, only just a couple of weeks after the, the emergency was declared. And then we start to have first cases outside of China. So on the 13th of January, there was the first case of um, the coronavirus in Thailand. And then on January the, January the 20th, the World Health Organization then officially declared that it was detecting other countries. And these are countries such as, um, so Thailand and the United States was on the uh, 21st, the following day. So it even reached now um, right across the globe. And then on the 23rd of January, the local authorities in Wuhan just said, right, we need to try and contain this. We are now going to start shutting things down. So they shut down the buses, they shut down the subways, the ferries, and they start cancelling planes and trains. And I'll come back to why this is very, very important very, very shortly when I talk a little bit about the situation of the geography of Wuhan. But um, here's a really fantastic image taken on the 3rd of February, and which is really incredible because it's so rare that you see, as you can see, it's during the day. This, you can see it's lit up as daylight here and there is hardly any traffic on this road. And for those of us who have studied China quite extensively, or we show images uh, about China's development, usually we see these transport links completely packed with cars and compact with buses and, and bustling around. But this image taken on the, on the 3rd of February just goes to show how restrictive the measures that the local authorities took in place to try and, to try and stem this tide. Of course, the other confounding fact to think as well is that this is now around the, the age of the Chinese New Year, the time of the Chinese New Year. So people would be kind of sticking to certain areas, going home to certain places, but I think you'll agree that to have a picture where there's absolutely almost no one on the road is quite, is quite unique. So I'm gonna set this map into animation now. So we're going on to the 23rd of January and onwards. So of course now we've gone past the point where the, they've restricted travel at, in and out of Wuhan. But the trouble is, is that the coronavirus has, a, has an incubation period a period of time where symptoms don't show between anything between two and 12 days. And the average seems to be about five days according to official sources. But as you can see here, as time goes on, so now we're into uh, February, so the 7th of February, after the restrictions were even put in place, you have this really deep spread across China. Now what's really, really interesting here, if we see this map here, sorry if I go off screen a bit, so you can see, if we see this map here, this is all of the um, air passengers that go from Wuhan out to other places in China because Wuhan is a, is a hub for domestic travel as well as international travel. So let's move on to the global stage now. So again, let's start at the, the 13th. So that's the, the, the date that the first case outside of China. So that's here in Thailand. So if we just step forward a few, time, a few times now, it's so the 24th. So now we start to get cases here in the United States, down here in Australia. And then you see the pattern here that you've got this cluster around here in, in Eastern and Southeast Asia. And now we also start to have um, some appearance of the virus here in France. But not as yet can we classify this as a pandemic, and a, a global pandemic, and we'll come back to that very shortly. So it's moving on to the end of the month. So China's cases are rocketing, and you've now got neighboring countries to the, to the secondary affected countries here. So we've got Canada now, as well as the United States. We've got more clusters appearing in, in Europe. Um, and now you can see the first one's in Italy, and of course Italy's been on the news quite recently um, with regards to what's going on there. And then the 14th, and you can see how now we're starting to get the appearance of one here in South America, and then the first cases here in Egypt in Africa. And this is the latest map that I have for you today, so you can see the almost current situation here. But can we classify this as a global pandemic? Well. The World Health Organization don't use the term pandemic anymore. So you can look this up yourself. They're actually using the term such as global health emergency, and that's the actual official term or similar to that that they're actually using. So they're not actually gonna use this word pandemic. So what you might want to do, a good challenge for, for you and your students is to set, maybe set an inquiry con condition, is that does now the coronavirus classify, classify the 
or the classic definition of a pandemic. So where a virus has spread, it's way above the background rate. It's there's spikes happening in many different countries across the globe, and it's traveling quite rapidly across, across transport links. So, but you will not hear the word pandemic officially from WHO sources. So give us a bit of geography from Wuhan. So why Wuhan? Why maybe if this set off somewhere else in China, maybe would it have spread so quickly? You could argue that maybe yes, in, in hub cities, you know, like Beijing, Shanghai, Chongqing, um, Chengdu, maybe the case would be similar. Um, so let's have a look at the kind of situation of Wuhan and then we can kind of understand how things spread very, very quickly from there. So the first things first is that there's a huge population now. I mean, the population of New York City is about 10 million. The population of London is about 8 million. So, so the city of Wuhan has got a population of 11 million people. So that is a, a lot of people clustered in a very highly dense, dense area. So of course, the fact that the coronavirus spreads from a person to person through direct touch of bodily fluids, um, where you've got especially a lot of people in close quarters, there's obviously um, a very uh, easy way for the disease to be transmitted from person to person. It is a major transport hub. In fact, 11 flights a week go from Wuhan to Beijing. So not only is it a transport hub internationally, going from direct flights to San Francisco, Dubai, New York City, and many European countries, but also it's a transport hub for, for the rest of China. And when I showed you that map just up here, you'll see that how all those, those, those yellow areas and those bubbles kind of match to show that the, uh, the transport's going from Wuhan in the center of China all around. It is a place of heavy industry as well. And from a European point of view, there is, um, there is Renault and Peugeot there are two um, French automotive companies who have a very, very strong presence in Wuhan. In fact, there's more than 80 French firms in Wuhan. So it just goes to show that Wuhan is a place of globalization and there's a lot of manufacturing taking place and a lot of European um, companies are basing themselves there, manufacturing there. So, so not only have you got the shift of, of, of people and movement and in that respect, you've got the, shift, the shipment of goods going along transport links as well. So there's a lot of activity out of Wuhan in that respect. And finally, it is a place for tourism. And uh, something that a lot of geography teachers and geography students have studied a lot, of course, is the Three Gorges Dam. So Wuhan on the Yangtze River is a gateway to the Group Three Gorges Dam, usually tours set off for the Three Gorges Dam from Wuhan and then the surrounding area of Wuhan, there's beautiful lakes and hills. Um, and this time of year, of course, you've also got Chinese New Year, which also has a compounding factor. Going back to that map I showed you at the very first of the video, you know, there was also this, this, this fear number of five million people fleeing the city of Wuhan. Well, actually, that, that, was, that was a bit of sensationalist news being combined with that map. And the actual truth of that is that 5 million people were moving from Wuhan in order to celebrate Chinese New Year and other places. Perhaps they're going to visit family in other places since Wuhan is a place for migrant workers. So they're moving back home to go and celebrate Chinese New Year. And that's where that figure of 5 million came from. So I showed you the Chinese ver the China version of this map from the, the hub of Wuhan, the domestic hub of Wuhan. But here's the international destinations now. So passengers flying from from Wuhan to other countries. And this is from the New York Times. This is from, from where that other map came from before. And you can see here that you have, um, so between the dates of October and November, which is the latest figures that, that this article has. So you've got 8,000 uh, people traveling from, to the United States from Wuhan between the, on this month here. And you see there's a cluster in Europe here, but most of them, you have a cluster in Eastern Asia and Southeast Asia here. But interestingly, if you now compare this map with the current situation globally, you can see there's quite a strong correlation between um, where these flights have been taking place, so from Wuhan as an international hub, to where we have our cases of coronavirus, at least um, at the time of, uh, as this map is showing, of the 31st of January. So you see there's quite a strong correlation here, which is gonna suggest, of course, that the transport links and the flight system is really having um, an impact in helping to spread this disease around the world. And of course, to remind you that this incubation period of between two to 12 days of an average of five days, people could be getting on a flight and the disease is not detectable in them. They might not yet be having a fever. They may be what's called asymptomatic, or they could even be completely asymptomatic, which means they may not show symptoms at all. Some people don't show symptoms at all, but they still are carriers. 
And it seems to be that people of, of my age group, so middle age group kind of are the ones who are more likely to show symptoms, whereas the, the younger and quite the older don't tend to see, show very many symptoms or no symptoms at all. So, so the disease could be spreading beyond detection as well. So you can put all these things in place. You can fire a, a infrared um, det temperature detection gun at, the, you know, at their forehead, but it still might not detect the, uh, the fact they got a fever. And of course, is that fever due to coronavirus? So just go show how tricky it is to control the spread of, of this disease. Okay, to finish off now, I'm gonna just put a link back to an old blog post of mine. So from the Geographical Association Conference in, in 2018, there was a fantastic talk by Dr. Hannah Fry, and, what, and it was a keynote talk, and one of the things she actually talked about was the BBC outbreak, the BBC pandemic um, project that she worked on. So, and this was actually so interesting for you to go back and look at this in retrospect now, about how, a pan, how an epidemic may cross um, across the United Kingdom and it was meant to be an, an app that you can have a look at and the data would be sent to places like the NHS to see how they could prepare for things like this. So very, very um, interesting to go back and have a look at this now. Now jump on this very, very quickly because the um, documentary is still available but I think it's only available for two weeks from, from now. So by the time I upload this video, probably about a week and a half. So, so do jump on that but the website will be available for you to look at and of course you can come to my blog entry here and read about what she talked about this project that she worked on with the BBC about the spread of disease. Okay, so that's it for this month. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, as always, I want to pay uh, very much uh, a lot of thanks to WeatherQuest who lend the time, the expertise and the equipment for me ab able to do these videos. Please do check out their YouTube um, channel. If you love being on top of case studies, particularly weather and climate case studies, and you want official um, authoritative information within a week or two of it happening, then WeatherQuest almost always cover these kind of uh, events and so it's definitely worth subscribing to their channel. Of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and follow me on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you.